And so this is the topic that's been in the news quite a bit lately. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit of the background about how our brains work. Um, and, uh, and then Lou and Dupont are gonna take over from there and tell you about some of the mechanisms that occur in, in addiction and long-term changes in the brain. Uh, but I wanna start off with something a little bit different. So this is a picture of the Serengeti Plains in Africa. Um, and you might be saying, like, what does this have to do with our brains and, and technology? And um, did we go to the wrong talk? Well, actually, no, you're in the right place. Um, what I want you to do is imagine that you're an animal living out here in the Serengeti, like this giraffe or, or maybe a lion or a hyena. Or if you came to last month's Science and News talk, uh, you saw a little bit about human evolution and anthropology, you might imagine that you're one of the early uh, human ancestors um, who are actually living out here in, in the Serengeti. Um, so well, if, you're, if you're dropped off in the middle of this place, how are you going to survive? Um, and if, if you're going to live for more than a couple days, uh, you're going to rely on some of the things that are out here in the, in the environments. It's things such as uh, the sights and smells and sounds. Um, you're going to try to find food for uh, sustenance. You want to avoid predators. You want to avoid like all the lions and um, cheetahs. And uh, you're going to probably want to try to find shelter. And for a lot of animals that live out here, they're, they're, they're social animals, and that includes humans. Um, you, you worry about who are your allies, who are your enemies. You want to find potential mates to have offspring. And a lot of this information occurs in patterns, such as like if you see uh, vultures circling overhead, that probably means that there's like a recently killed uh, a gazelle or something that you might be able to, to eat for dinner. And so all this information comes together, and you have to process it somehow. And that's what our brains are doing. They're taking information from the environment, putting it into context. Um, and this is you know, basically really crucial to our survival and how animals interact with the environment. Um, but we no longer live in the Serengeti. We live in a, in a technological society. Um, and so we've actually changed. We're at the point where our brains allow us to change our environment and build it. Um, and so now we have, you know, communications technology um, and media and now social networking. Um, and we don't have to worry about being killed by a lion or uh, where to find our dinner. But we're still using our brains to process information. And so uh, I just want to take a quick look at how the information environment has changed uh, with communications technology. So we start off with the 1800s and uh, the uh, telegraph. And then what, you, what you'll see is that every few years, a uh, new technology comes up. But they're spaced out like five or 10 years. And you have mass media, the movies, television, radio. And it's not until after World War II that communication satellites, the early internet. And then in the 70s and 80s, you get personal computers. Um, and subsequently after that, the internet, World Wide Web, um, and cell phones, and all kinds of uh, social networking um, sites. And so, uh, what's ha what you can see is that the pace of innovation is actually accelerating. It's not slowing down at all. So we're being thrown multiple platform, information platforms are coming at us, and we have to adjust to that. And so people are asking if uh, all of these technologies are somehow changing our brain. And so what's the uh, information of the environment of today? Well, it's uh, technology that's always available, accessible. It's really fast. It gives you instant information. Uh, connectivity to your friends, you can play games online, um, and it's more information than you can ever process in your whole life. Um, and so a lot of people are wor getting worried that we might be overwhelmed. And so for example, this was a book that came out uh, from Nicholas Carr, it's called The Shadows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And in, in it he says that, uh, he asks if we are evolving from being cultivators of personal knowledge to hunters and gatherers in the electronic data force. We no longer have time to like, really deeply contemplate um, the way that perhaps our, our grandfathers did, our grandparents did. Um, and so I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, South Korea, because South Korea is sort of a leading indicator of uh, how our society is changing. They've invested a lot of money in getting the fastest internet, um, most accessible for the whole country. Um, and so they're considered like one of the most wired societies. And this has led to some problems. For example, um, worries about internet addiction. They're, uh, like there was this couple who were spending so much time uh, playing online games that they abandoned, basically abandoned their daughter. And she died of mal malnutrition. Um, and in Korea, you can actually earn a living playing online games. Like you can earn real money. 
Um, so there was a man who was playing, uh, he was playing for five days straight in, in an internet cafe, and he actually died um, because he wasn't getting sleep and nutrition. Um, there's also a really sad story of a, of a boy who was playing online so much, his mother was nagging him, and he got really um, angry and actually murdered her and then committed suicide. So Korea, uh, is, South Korea has actually spent a lot of money, uh, they want to study this issue, how it affects society, but also how it affects individuals. Um, and so they're investing a lot of uh, infrastructure um, into uh, research into this problem, uh, probably more so than, than we're doing here in the West. Uh, but we are worried, you know, here in the U.S. There's, you'll, you'll see headlines in the media. For example, uh, this is a story that came out studying the texting habits of uh, teenagers and found that 110 text messages per day is what some of the kids are doing. And that's, to me, that's pretty mind-blowing. That's like 40,000 text messages a year. But there's also worries about Facebook and, and how that's affecting kids' development and um, how, how they work in the classroom and how, they, how social networking social networking affects their relations to their peers. But it's also, at least to like a more basic question, how is all of this technology changing our brains and are we getting addicted? Um, well, no, first what I want to say is, um, let's take a look at what addiction is. So we can define it as dependence on a substance or activity. Um, and so what you see is that a person is no longer, uh, a person who's an addict is no longer to uh, control their behavior. And so this leads to increase in dependence even when they know that there's harmful consequences to their addictions. Um, so if I say the word addiction, most people will probably think of drugs, as an addictive substances like uh, cocaine or ecstasy, or uh, also alcohol. And uh, you may have also read in the news about the obesity epidemic, and so there's some evidence that food can actually be an addictive agent as well. And then there's um, news stories about activities that can be addictive. Uh, like too much TV or addiction to video games or gambling. And as well, people even talk about shopaholics being addicted to shopping or uh, sports, uh, in extreme sports. So what we're asking, what we're going to ask today are things like Facebook and uh, Twitter, uh, the modern internet, are those also addictive agents? So this is actually a controversial topic. Um, the mental health clinicians who, who work and treat um, uh, addictions, they're debating amongst themselves whether internet addiction should be classified um, as uh, a real addiction in their manual, which is DSM-5, that stands for Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. So that's what people, um, that's what mental health doctors actually use to diagnose um, um, addictions. And so uh, this, has, this debate is going to have a big impact on whether something like uh, Medicare or your insurance would cover the cost if you need to you know, be diagnosed and get treatment for internet addiction. And so while this debate is ongoing, um, it is safe to say that we're trying to understand if internet addiction um, is a, uh, an actual um, addiction. And if we want to under understand how it works, um, we need to know how it affects our brains. And so before, uh, so, so if you want to understand any kind of addiction, um, we have to spend a few minutes talking about how our brains work. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, giving you some, some basics. So the job of the nervous system is a little bit like a computer. It's uh, to take in information, process it, and then um, you have a behavior at the end. So you have input, processing, and then output. And the input can be something like uh, what you see and what you hear from the environment. It can also be physiological information from your body, like if you feel too hot or too cold. Um, and uh, so the, the brain and the nervous system will um, prioritize that information, process it, some of it will go into memory, and then uh, the outcome is your behavior. And uh, so to understand how the nervous system works, let's take a look and see what it actually looks like. So this is your body, and all of uh, what's shown here is, is different parts of your nervous system. So we have the brain, the spinal cord, and all the nerves that go throughout your body, and they're all connected. Um, and the uh, nervous system is made up of many cells, which are called neurons, and so this is a picture of a neuron. Um, and they have all these long, thin projections. Those projections are called axons and dendrites, and axons send information, and dendrites receive information. Um, and the green, all these green, Bundles are nerves, which are actually made of um, axon, bundles of axons. 
You may have heard of the phrase form follows function, um, maybe in art class. And so this principle actually applies to our bodies as well, and it applies to the nervous system. So the shape of the neuron, with all these long, thin axons and dendrites, is related to its job, which is to move uh, information around. So information will move from one side to the other along the axons and dendrites. And likewise, the shape of our nerves and, and, and our nervous system is related to that information um, processing as well. So when scientists look at um, brain function, when they're doing experiments, they can look at different scales. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out big and then zoom in, uh, look at smaller and smaller regions. So we start out big, we'll look at the organ level, um, such as the brain. And then if we take like a very tiny piece of this and put it on a microscope, then we can look at, at the tissues, the tissues that make up your brain. And if we take a tiny piece of this and then zoom in, we can look at the individual cells, the neurons. And there are also uh, different kinds of cells in your brain as well that have important jobs. Um, and then if we zoom in even further, we can look at the subcellular level. And uh, we can even look at the molecules that make up your brain. And we can look at all, at all these levels and see uh, what's going on. But what I'd like to point out is that every single one of these levels, the job is the same. It's information transfer. Uh, processing and transmission. Uh, it's taking input and making output. Even the molecules in your brain are very crucial to this process. So, uh, okay, how does something that's like squishy and soft um, as a nerve cell or as your brain, how does that work with information? So I'm not gonna go into the, the real nitty gritty details here today, um, but basically what happens is that uh, information is encoded in the form of an electrical voltage impulse, which travels very fast. It's even faster than what's shown in this movie. They had to slow it down so you could actually follow what's happening. And so this voltage impulse is traveling from one part of the neuron to the other one. And that's how information uh, moves. It's not exactly the same way as uh, the way electricity flows through <coughs> the wires in a computer chip, uh, but it is similar. So it's a useful way to think about it. So once that voltage impulse has reached the end of the axon, then it has, the information has to get transferred to another cell. So it does this at a um, subcellular structure called the synapse. So this is a picture of a synapse. There's two neurons here. This is the, the, the at the top, we'll call this the transmitting neuron, uh, or the transmitting axon. And then down here is the dendrite, which is going to receive information. And so there's a message that's sent, and the message comes in the form of a chemical signal and these are called neurotransmitters. So it, it, similar to the way that um, when two people were talking, or as I'm talking to you, I'm being the transmitter. I'm making a message, and I'm sending it to you by talking. And then you're receiving that by hearing that. That's uh, actually pretty similar to the way neurons talk. There is a trans, the transmitter cell and a receiver cell. And the, the message is the neurotransmitter molecule. So how does this work? Um, so on the these are the neurotransmitters shown here. On the receiving cell are molecules called receptors. And so what's gonna happen? The voltage impulse arrives, and then the neurotransmitter chemical signals are released, and they bind to the receptors. And then once the receptors and the neurotransmitters are bound, then the receivers act, the receptors activate a new voltage impulse. So scientists are really interested in the synapse because when, if there's something goes wrong with this process, it could lead to uh, certain neuropathologies, which are diseases of the brain. Um, and so they're interested in finding out if uh, possibly uh, neurotransmitter, uh, problems with the neurotransmitter might contribute to something like uh, Parkinson's disease or depression. And also, it's very important to, under, uh, to understand neurotransmitters because they contribute to addiction. And so Lou is going to tell you about that in the second part today. Um, so think of what happens if you uh, get a funny cat picture, like from your mom or somebody. So, so what do you do? Like, like if you get this on the shelf, what do you do? Somebody. You forward it. That's right. <laughs> you send it to your friends. So neurons are the same way. If they get a message and they like it, they want to share it with their friends, other neurons. So this is going to show what's going to happen. Um, so this is the, the first neuron. We'll call it neuron A. It sends a message to neuron B. 
And then Neuron B says, I like that, I'm going to send it to Neuron C, and then so on. So this is how information goes from neuron to neuron to neuron. Um, and so you can see how information can spread across the nervous system. So just like you can have like different messages when you're communicating with a person, the, uh, neurons actually use different neurotransmitters. Um, so these are sort of like different flavors. And you can ima uh, just imagine that each one of these different colors is a different neurotransmitter, and it's sending a different message. <laughs> so this is uh, one way to communicate different kinds of information um, in, the, in the brain. So if you have a bunch of people who are talking to each other, or let's say a bunch of people that are sending each other uh, messages, um, that's actually called a social network. Like here, here, here's a map of different people that have different social connections. So in the brain, we can make a, a map of uh, networks which we call circuits or neural, uh, neural circuits. Um, and so when you have enough connections between different neurons, you can actually do very complex information processing. Um, and so this is somewhat like the way if you add more transistors to a computer chip, you get more power, more processing power. So in the brain, um, different circuits can cr control different can kinds of behavior outputs. Um, and sometimes you get circuits that are actually competing with, with each other. One circuit's trying to win, and that determines what, what, what the behavior is. And it turns out that, in addition, these circuits uh, can be hijacked. Um, and so in the third part, uh, Dupont is going to tell you about how that works. So st stay tuned for that story. Just waiting for the next slide. Okay. So these images show some of the complexity that I'm talking about. So uh, these are pictures from a microscope. They're taken actually from a mouse brain. And uh, this, m these mice were engineered so that every, uh, all the different neurons in their brain would have a different color. So you can actually trace, like for example, look at this blue neuron here. And then you can follow down, look at all the dendrites. The dendrites have a lot of branches. You see all the blue branches here? And likewise, here, here's a, uh, its neighbor cell, which is pink, and you can see all the pink branches. And it's a very uh, complex uh, and, and very beautiful shape. And you can just imagine the number of contact points, the, the number of synapses um, in these images. It's too many to count, actually, just, just for right now. But a, a single neuron can have hundreds or even thousands of synaptic uh, connections. And so this is just a mouse brain. In the human brain, we, can, we can't even count them all. We have to estimate. And our best estimations is that there could be 100 billion neurons in, in our brain uh, forming over 100 trillion synaptic connections. Now, I can't wrap my head around that number. It's, it's just too big. But I'll try to put it in perspective. So if you uh, took all the connection points on the internet, say, between my computer and the router, or between you know, your cell phone and, and, uh, and the cell phone company, or all the servers, you add up all those connection points, um, that's one trillion uh, synapses on the internet. So your brain actually has 100 times more uh, connection points than the whole internet. Um, so, so all of this complexity is actually what allows our brains to do some pretty impressive uh, processing power, such as what is needed to survive um, out in the Serengeti. So I spent the last few minutes using different kinds of analogies. Like I've been, I've been telling you that your brain is like, uh, is like a computer. But um, are you actually a computer? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> We're very different uh, from machines. Uh, our brains, um, ha I, I, the main way that our brain is different is it has to ch change. So changes in the brain circuitry are very important for things like learning and memory, um, and as well as being part of uh, neuropathologic diseases in the brain. And they're also, the changes that occur during addiction. Um, and if our brains never changed, we actually wouldn't be able to learn new information. And so there has to be like this balance between control, making sure everything's working, and changing. And as an illustration of um, why change is important, let's look at this young boy. Now, most of you probably don't recognize him. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, come back in a few years after he's added some more neurons and some, made some new synapses. Now he's a young man. Some of you might uh, recognize who it is. But 
what I'll do is I'll keep, uh, we're going to add some more synapses. Now, now he's getting a little bit smarter, a little bit more famous. And uh, finally, now you can recognize who this is. Uh, of course, it's Albert Einstein, the famous physicist. Um, so it, you can see like the importance of uh, changing and adding synapses and, and changing in the brain. And if it weren't, if it weren't for these changes, um, Einstein might have just been like a very average uh, everyday dude instead of a genius. Um, and this is a picture of his brain, actually. That's, that's his real brain. And um, so I'd like to illustrate uh, change and growth at the cellular level, but um, we can't use Einstein for that. So I'm going to use uh, sea slug, uh, which is the animal I work with um, in Paul Forcher's uh, research group here at Yale. And so this is a movie that was made by a grad student in Paul's lab. Her name is Callan. And so this is a neuron that was taken out of the sea slug, and it's put onto a, a dish, and then she's going to watch it in a microscope. And she, so she made a movie. And what you're going to see is actually 12 hours in the life of this neuron. And you're going to see, uh, as I play it, um, you're going to see all these projections come out. And so these projections are actually moving very, they're, they're branching and they're, and they're moving away from the cell. And these are going to go on to form axons and dendrites, and they're going to make synapses. And so my colleagues in, in, uh, in Paul Forcher's lab and uh, other people in the um, uh, neuroscience uh, field are, are trying to understand how this happens at the cellular and subcellular level. Um, and that's very important for how our brains work. And um, so I just want to leave you with a little information on other ways that our brains change. For example, during um, addiction or exposure to technology. So scientists have shown that playing video games can have some beneficial effects. For example, it can improve your uh, visual perception, um, being able to track moving objects. Um, they, they also found that there's negative effects to heavy gaming, um, such as issues with related to attention deficit uh, symptoms. Um, and what's down here is uh, images from a study where uh, they were using a technique called MRI to image brain activity. And so these were teenagers who were actually playing video games while they were doing the MRI imaging. And they compared teenagers who were uh, heavy gamers, maybe uh, uh, addicted to video games, versus teenagers who were just like normal teenagers. And they found that this area of the brain was more responsive during certain times in the gameplay in the teenagers who were uh, video game addicts. So this pattern, th this pattern is actually very similar to what they see when they do MRIs on people who have gambling addiction. So it suggests that heavy gaming might cause uh, connectivity in the brain to change. Um, and, but it might be that there's like genetic factors or other factors that are at play. So it's a little bit early to say exactly what's going on, but we need to do more research on this. And so Lou is going to talk a little bit more about the mechanisms of addiction in relation to uh, gambling um, and um, uh, Facebook in the next part. So to uh, summarize, uh, we talked a little bit about technology and how it's changing our, uh, the, the environment in which our brains work. Um, I told you about how our brains uh, transmit and process information and the importance of connections in, in brain function in um, our everyday life. And uh, we talked about how brains change um, at the level of neurons and circuits. Uh, during, they change during development, they change with uh, exposure to, to technology, and they change in addiction. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to Lou next. Thank you. Thank you.